This is a brief overview of the program structure used for population genetic analyses. To give you the idea, I'd like to start by discussing with you the ancestry kits that are so popular nowadays where you spit into a jar, they analyze your DNA, and they tell you about your ancestry, that you're this percentage of this ancestry and that percentage of that ancestry. So for instance, consider the company 23andMe, which is one of the big ones that participates in this service. And here's an example of some output from 23andMe. Uh, I got this information from a public website. So this person, Roberta Estes, was found from her DNA to be 99.4% European with a small amount of East Asian or Native American and Middle Eastern or North African ancestry. You can represent the different components of ancestry in a pie chart like this. Or you can represent the different components of ancestry as a bar graph. Please try to overlook the fact that I accidentally converted Roberta into Robert. But the point remains that if we look at this bar graph representing Roberta, we see that nearly 100% of her DNA is European in origin. In contrast, let's look at Jamie King's DNA. And this is from another publicly available website. In Jamie King's case, she is 47% European, 42% East Asian or Native American, 5% Sub-Saharan African, and about 1.3% uh, North African or Middle Eastern. You can represent that as a pie chart, or you can represent that as a bar graph. And this is a stacked bar graph. So this square here shows you that Jamie is almost 50% European. And then here's the next segment, which is another almost 50% East Asian or Native American with smaller amounts of Sub-Saharan and African and Middle Eastern or North African ancestries and a composition of other. But together, this sums up to 100% because we're trying to figure out what are the sum totals of Jamie's ancestry. We can compare Jamie's ancestry to Roberta's ancestry side by side, and we can see that Roberta has much more European ancestry than Jamie, although Jamie still has a substantial contribution, and Jamie has a much larger ancestry of East Asian or Native American whereas there's none or virtually none in Roberta's ancestry. So you can look here and we can compare the ancestries of Roberta to Jamie by looking at these bar graphs side by side. They're containing the same information as a pie chart, except instead of it being circular, it's in the form of this stacked bar graph. Now this next thing I'm going to show you is pretty weird, but it will become evident later on why I am showing you this. We can take these two bar graphs that are far apart you see this white space here in between the two bar graphs? I can show you the same information and get rid of that white space. So here's the bar graph for Roberta. Here's the, the bar graph for Jamie. They're still showing you the same information in the same format as the other slide. It's just that I've gotten rid of the white space. Why would you do that, you may wonder. That's less easy to read. Well, it turns out that it makes things easier to read when you have a lot of specimens. Here I'm only showing you two, but showing the data in this format becomes easier when you have a lot of specimens. Now this, this graph at first blush is difficult to interpret, but it's like the other one that you saw here. Uh, these coefficients uh, go from zero to one, but, but uh, these could just as easily be percentages. So you could think about these as percentages, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, etc. These individuals in columns here are the individuals from my study. This is from a paper I did in 2010. Uh, these individuals here are not humans. These are individual plants. But 
just like with humans, we can figure out the different ancestries that the plants belong to. In this case, we don't know from what geographic area these plants' ancestors came from, but we can still identify a group one ancestor, a group two ancestor, group three, group four, group five, and group six. And those are similar to the ancestries we have here, except here, in the case of 23andMe, we were able to give those different ancestries a name and a location, whereas here we just know that there are six different ancestries. And we can see, for instance, that this plant here, which has this identification label, this particular individual plant here has its ancestry almost entirely from group one. Uh, likewise for this plant here and this plant here. But we can see that some plants have a very mixed ancestry. Uh, for example, this plant here has a substantial amount of its ancestry deriving from group six and a substantial amount of its ancestry deriving from group four. Again, what you want to do is you want to read up and down a column. So there's no helpful little line here to help you see, uh, to, to keep your eyes looking within a column. So you, you just have to know that this whole thing here is one individual. This is one column. This is an entirely different individual. Have a look at this individual here. This individual has a very mixed ancestry. A substantial contribution of its ancestry comes from group six, but it also has uh, non-trivial amounts of ancestry from group five, group three, group two, and group one, and so on and so forth. So like 23andMe, but here we're looking at plants. So here there was a similar algorithm that was used to f discover based upon the DNA of these plants what the ancestries of these plants were. And you can go out even farther and have more, by which I mean you can have even more specimens. So each one of these little tick marks here corresponds to a different specimen. And you can see that these specimens don't have friendly names. Uh, these aren't humans. Uh, I don't believe, maybe they are humans, but in any event, they're not labeled by names. They're labeled by uh, ID labels. But this is an individual here, individual number two. And uh, this individual you can see has all of its ancestry or virtually all of its ancestry deriving from ancestor V1. Whereas this individual here, we can't read the label because they're all scrunched together, but this individual here has a substantial amount of its ancestry from population V3 and another substantial contribution coming from population V1 uh, uh, and another substantial contribution coming from the inferred ancestral population V2 and so on and so forth. The important thing is to get used to looking at these where the y-axis is your percentages, or if they're not in terms of percentages, you can just multiply by 100. So you can think of this as 100%, 75%, 50%, 25%, 0%, just to, to convert from probability to percentage. And always with these, with these plots, you read up and down a column and you sum together the different colors uh, to get the full ancestry of that individual. So this whole column here is still I individual number two. It's just that right here we're looking at many, many different individuals. There's a little white space separating the individual bar graphs from one another, but there's not a lot. Everything squished in is, is squished in a lot together. And you can squish it in even more. So this is an example comparing the genetics of dogs to the genetics of jackals. And in this case, there's only two inferred ancestral groups, dogs and jackals. And here you can't even see the individual columns. You can kind of in guess that there's little individual columns because you can see a little square of jackal ancestry here. So you can kind of see the width of the column. So this column here corresponds to one dog. Right next to it, we have another column corresponding to another dog and so on. So you can't, there, and there's not even labels corresponding to the individual dogs, Fido, Rex, uh, Fifi, etc. Uh, th that information is taken out and there's just a generic label here saying dogs. But still, every single little column here that's squished together is a separate individual. And the combination of colors you see going up and down the column tells you how much of that individual's ancestry comes from one ancestor versus another ancestor. So there's dogs. And so you can see that the 
ancestor uh, that, that corresponds to dogs is red. Here's jackals, same thing. You can see that the ancestry that corresponds to jackals is green. And again, all, there's each one of these is an individual jackal, but you, we don't even see the individual labels corresponding to the individual jackals. All that information is just too squished together. So instead, there's just one label here saying jackals. But let's look in here. Here we can see some hybrids. And what the authors of this paper did is they zoomed in. So if you zoom in, this looks more familiar. So this is an individual that was collected from the wild in Croatia, I believe. And this individual has about 40% of its ancestry tracing to dogs and the other 60% of its ancestry tracing to jackals. This individual here has about 75% of its ancestry tracing to dogs and the other 25% tracing to jackals. Here's another example, mostly jackal, but we can see a little bit of its ancestry comes from dogs. So this is a way that you can look at hybrids. The point is with this sort of a clustering technique, both the kind used by 23andMe and the kind called structure, which is the kind that was used for this example here with dogs and jackals, and this example here with, I forget what organism this is, and with my example here with plants. Here we used the program structure. Not only does it allow you to see how many different ancestors the individuals have and to group your individuals based on their ancestry, but it also lets you see hybrids, right? And in fact, when you're looking at 23andMe, you can see when you're when you when you get back your 23andMe results, it's often very exciting to see all of the different hybrid ancestries that uh, we each have that rep that represent our DNA from these different ancestors. So what is structure? Structure is a Bayesian cluster analysis that is commonly used in population genetics to make plots like the ones that I showed you. There are other software that do the same thing, that make these same kinds of plots where you can cluster things together and look at the bar graphs and the stacked bar graphs and look at the amounts of different ancestries and look at hybridization. There's, a, for instance, a program called Instruct. There's another one that 23andMe uses that's called Ancestry Composition. But the idea is that structure in these other programs lets you visualize what populations each individual came from, whether that uh, individual is a human or whether that individual is, is from some other species. It, it takes, the, takes the DNA from your specimens, the, it, you code that DNA into the software, and the software then groups your individuals by the similarities in their DNA uh, and, it, and also is able to discover when individuals are hybrids from uh, these different uh, ancestors that it infers based upon the DNA. Structure shows you the ancestries of the individuals in your study, including individuals where you don't have any ideas about where they're in, about their ancestries or where they came from. So structure lets you take unknown specimens, add them to your study, and the software will group your unknown specimen according to the other specimens that it's most genetically similar to, and structure will show you the hybrid ancestries of your unknown individual. So you can see that your unknown individual is 20% derived from this group and 30% derived from that other group and 10% derived from that other group. That should give you an idea of the, the many of the different ways that the, the program structure is useful, uh, not just in terms of studying humans, which it is used for, but in terms of studying all sorts of, of uh, plants and animals and other living things. You can you can group them by the similarities in their DNA in such a way um, that you can also see what different kinds of ancestors made up the DNA of those individuals. For information specifically on the program structure, I recommend this paper, which can get dive, which can help you dive more into the mathematical uh, details of how the software works. If you want information on the clustering algorithm that is used by 23andMe, this, this, this algorithm that's called Ancestry Composition, uh, I recommend these two sources here from the 23andMe company, 
that can provide you details on that. 23andMe doesn't use the program structure or the algorithm and structure. They have their own algorithm that they derive, but it does the same thing. So there you have it. There is a brief overview of the program structure to give you the general idea, so you can go ahead and start using it in your own research.